the information contained in this lecture is strictly for educational pur purposes. <laughs> I am not a licensed medical doctor and I'm not pretending to be one. I'm not providing medical advice. Um, I'm not diagnosing or treating any, any conditions you have. Oops, your water spilled. Um, and none of the statements I make have been evaluated by the US Food and Drug Administration. And none of these suggestions are intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. So clear. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, okay, so where I like to start. So this is um, less an overview of like all natural healing and more just, <clears throat> excuse me, Dr. Christopher's methods, um, which he wasn't just an herbalist, like he was a true natural healer and he brings in um, a nice rounded out program. Um, and I love that he, unlike some herbalists back in the 1700s, 1800s that really wanted to create a monopoly around systems that they created. It didn't let anyone add to or question their system. Dr. Christopher brought in more people, um, you know, taught them his works, but he was always, they were always sharing what they learned together, um, which I think built a really really amazing collection of information and experience. Um, so first off, who here has ever had like a headache or some kind of pain and you asked someone who knew about herbs what to do about it and they said, take some white willow bark. No, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so that's where a lot of us start with herbs is it's like, okay, what do I do for this, which makes sense when we're suffering or uncomfortable, we want to alleviate it, reduce the symptoms, etc. cetera. Um, but that is actually still the same mindset as most of Western medicine. And we call it, <clears throat> excuse me, we call it atomism or atomist philosophy. And the idea for that is a pill for every ill. And the overarching theme is our bodies are not capable of fixing themselves. We have to do something to them. And throughout history, the, the medicines and, um, and methods that were used in, in that mindset, they had to be showy. We had to take mercury and vomit. Oh, look, it's working. Because <laughs> it's this big, obvious reaction. Um, and, and that's what people want. They want it, well, maybe not all of us as we learn more, but what many people want or have learned to believe over their lives is I need something that's going to work fast and like one and done. <laughs> like I want one remedy that fixes it after one dose and not have to worry about this ever again, which I totally get with my own struggles. I totally get like, okay, can I just take something that this will go away and I'll never have to deal it again, deal with it again. But what ends up happening there is we're not resolving the underlying issue. And when we're not resolving the underlying issue and we're just telling the symptoms, which is really just our body trying to tell us something's going on, <laughs> I need some attention. We're just saying, shh, 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 shh. go back in there. <laughs> and what happens is it buries deeper and it comes out later, often as something bigger and better <laughs> and worse. <laughs> Um, I feel like I can use words like worser because we have a cute baby in the audience <laughs> and we're among friends anyway. And so in contrast to that, the vitalist or vitalism philosophy, which is what Dr. Christopher really practiced is, um, the body is capable of healing itself. If we give it the right building blocks and environment to do so. So, um, and, and really the first person that, that we know of that practiced this philosophy was Hippocrates, who was called the father of medicine, but that's not actually the type of medicine that is typically practiced today. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and so I, I feel like this is a much more, I feel like this is much more in line with what we know about Heavenly Father and the plan of salvation that I don't think, like I, I believe, 
okay, we were given bodies to have experience and we're going to experience rough stuff. And some things maybe we can overcome in this lifetime and some things maybe we can't. And it's all for purpose, right? Um, but I also think our bodies are really amazing and can do a lot more than we give them credit for and give them the chance to do. Um, especially now that we're so disconnected, <laughs> except from in this community, we're so disconnected from what, you know, a more natural lifestyle would be. We're so disconnected from nature. Um, we're so fast and stressed out. Um, and our, it, it's just that much harder now for our bodies to just like catch a break <laughs> and have a chance to do what they need to do. Um, one of the lectures that we listened to in the course, uh, his, his name is Dr. Schultz, and he studied um, under Dr. Christopher and then lectured alongside him for a while until you know Dr. Christopher died and Dr. Schultz continued teaching at the school. But he quoted some literature that said, your body entirely renews itself in less than two years. They used to think it was seven, but it's actually two and depend. Yeah. Yeah. But if you're the same person you were two years ago, then you haven't given your body what it needs to rebuild itself healthier or better. And that's not to shame anyone. Right? <laughs> it is hopeful. Like, just think about that. Like you can make choices now that mean in two years, you'll have a better body. Hopefully you might my eyesight's gotten better <laughs> um but again like only only heavenly father knows your exact journey and what you need to live and experience in your lifetime and only you know what um what lifestyle is going to work for you in terms of like oh it's really easy for me to cook rice or like i would never do that okay you need something else you know to build your health um all right, before I get too, too off into the weeds, but it's fascinating. I mean, and that's just that every body system cycles through in, in less than two years, but some are a week or less, depending on the system. So there, there's a lot of hope there. Um, okay, so yeah, I'll tell that one later. Okay. <laughs> All right, so like I said, the, the vitalism is, the, is more true to Hippocrates and what he actually did. He healed a lot of people with mild foods, herbs, hydrotherapy, breathing, <laughs> hygiene, just getting them into a healthier state of being, which is funny because I don't know about you, but for me, at least how I was taught to think of history is like, you know, ancient Greece, like, okay, they had their togas and their temples, but like they were primitive people, right? Like, of course they were dirty and sick and whatever, but at the same time, like they had these amazing, um, you know, the aqueduct system and everything, like maybe they were more advanced than us and we don't know. So <laughs> I don't know, but at any rate, just to think like what worked then still works now. Maybe we have a lot more in common with those ancient people than we think, right? Like I would say, don't write it off. Well, it's because they lived in the stone ages. You know, I know the Greeks weren't stone ages, but just an example. All right. So um, how do we start to move over to a vitalist mentality? Well, one of the ways is if something comes up, I like to ask what is my body or someone else's body trying to do? Okay, so fever is the best example, okay? So we start to have a fever and, oh no, it's a fever. We have to lower it. That is the animist mentality. Something's gone wrong and we have to fix it, right? By, by doing something. Um, vitalist mentality, we can still do something, but it's what is the body trying to do and how can I help it? And so instead of lowering the fever, we get in a hot tub, we put herbs in the tub that make us sweat and we drink warm drinks with herbs that make us sweat because the fever is trying to raise our body temperature. Who knows what happens when our body temperature goes up? Bacteria and the virus. Yeah. And it's because it's mobilizing our white blood cells. 
to go gobble up the garbage. The bacteria can only live in a certain That as well. And there's different levels as, as you go. But, but the overall thing is it, it's, it's mobilizing the troops. And we're not just cleaning out bacteria and viruses. Some, if we get high enough, we clean out cancer cells. So it's an incredible way of our bodies cleansing. And, and <clears throat> as long as we keep it wet, as long as we are hydrating, a fever can be a wonderful healing crisis for the body. Healing crisis really just means we're doing a whole lot of healing really fast. It does mean that we do need to make sure we are hydrating or providing the nutrients that we need to support our body through that very, very fast healing, right? Um, do people die from fevers? Yes. <laughs> um, but were they hydrating? Were they, um, did, were they taking fever reducers? And then as soon as that fever reducer ran out, the body was like, here we go. And goes really, really fast, really high. Um, in fact, that's um, some things I've read when you get you know, the febrile convulsions, which for the most part are actually not dangerous at all. Um, those sometimes happen naturally, but more often it happens after you've tried to reduce the fever um, and then the body's trying to ramp it back up really quick. Um, <clears throat> so we could talk about fevers for an hour, but this is just one example of fighting with the body versus working with the body. Um, cause our body has incredible checks and balances in place. We just have to understand them a little better and give them what they need. Um, yeah. I just read somewhere that sometimes doctors would have and I think they put you in cold water. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that would be control. It would be the contrary solution to the problem. Yeah. It would lower the fever. By putting you in cold water. Right. And it, and it kind of depends. Like if you, if you have a traumatic brain injury and that's why you have a fever, totally different story. Like let the doctors do whatever they need to do there. <laughs> um, and, and there are some genetic conditions where a high fever is very dangerous. It's very rare, but it does happen. Um, did you have... I was just going to say a lot of times what happens, just like you were saying, they've taken, they've taken stuff to keep the fever under check yeah. and, instead of letting the body heal. And right. so then by the, when that stuff runs out, then the, like you said, the, body, yeah. the temperature goes way too high yeah. and then they have to do something to get it down. But it's actually because they haven't been working with their body. From yeah. The beginning. yeah. And, and really that's where it gets scary is if it's rising so rapidly. Right. Um, but normally if we haven't interfered, the body has a natural check and balance, especially if you help it sweat it out. Um, From the very start. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it's never too late to sweat it out. Um, <laughs> all right. Um, so, that's, so that's just one example with fevers. Um, so two more quick ones. <laughs> Try to be quick. Um, so seizures is an, oh yes, please. Atomist versus the vitalist is atom A T O M. Or yeah. Okay. Yeah, just like the atoms and molecules. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So seizures, an example here. I'm trying to, going to try to go quicker through these. Um, so a seizure, our body is seizing. What David Christopher says is that our bodies are trying to grab nutrients. So we feed the, ner the nervous system if we want to stop seizures from happening. There's also antispasmodic herbs that help calm the spasms, which is, it might sound like a more atomist thing, but the thing about herbs is when you use the whole herb, like lobelia is antispasmodic, but it also has so many other properties in it that it's just generally relaxing things and opening them up, which is not suppressing anything. Does that make sense? <laughs> um, and then the third example is coughs. So who loves coughing it out? <laughs> nope. <laughs> right? <laughs> um, so when we're coughing, what's our body trying to do? Yeah, we're trying to get, we're trying to get the bad stuff out. So do we wanna stop the bad stuff from getting out? No, we gotta get it out better. So the herbs that we would take when we have a cough 
We would want to boost our immune system. We would want to open up our airways and relax our throat. Um, and then we have herbs that help break up the mucus and help it be thinner and come out better. Um, and then we can also soothe the tissues as we go. So we can do all of that at once and still be working with the body. And the idea being you might cough a little more at first, but it will get you through the cough faster rather than having a cough for like the next year. <laughs> Speaking of coughs, I'm going to get my water. <clears throat> okay. All right. So I want to share a quote that I really like here. Um, this is a master herbalist that we study her, her book at the school. Oh, I didn't mention, I do not, rec I, oh, of course I recommend the school. I do not represent the school. I have to make that very clear. <laughs> I'm sharing what I've learned from them, but I'm not speaking as a representative. Okay. So, um, so this is by Sandra Ellis, who's a master herbalist and she was an incredible midwife. Um, if we understand that the body is a whole entity that is all connected, then we will come to understand that we have to treat the whole body, not just the area where we are seeing symptoms. When we cleanse and nourish, we eliminate the body's toxins, and then we give it the tools, nourishment, that it needs to rebuild itself. So I hope that kind of wraps up <laughs> the concept I've been trying to explain here. Um, so let's talk about... Oh, that wasn't in there. Okay. So let's talk about the nourishing part and then we will wrap up on the cleansing part. So when we nourish, there's two types of foods and this is um, different than certifications, different than organic chemistry, et cetera. But Dr. Christopher talked about foods in terms of being organic and inorganic. Excuse me. <clears throat> Oh, sorry, that was right on the microphone. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So our inorganic foods are the ones that are not alive. It is food from rocks, like crushed up eggshell, <laughs> um, crushed up crustacean shells, or, you know, if you took calcium pills, that's usually what they'd be made of. Um, and those substances, when they go into our body, they're not, they don't have life. They don't have the same energy and vibrance, um, vibration. They're very low vibration compared to our live foods. Um, so you think about your wholesome foods like sprouts, um, fruits, like raw, fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, I couldn't find the image, although I found some rather fantastic images on the internet of of hamburgers with psychedelic backgrounds, but I was trying to find this image where um, the scientists, they took pictures of a hamburger with, with a specific type of imaging um, software frequency. Oh, I think it was that one. And it shows the, the hamburger and um, the beef patty, there's, there's no signature, there's no vibration, it's just dead. <laughs> the lettuce, was had a little glow, the tomato had a little glow, the bun was dead, and the sesame seeds were glowing. <laughs> um, just as an example of, of showing high vibration foods and low vibration foods. And what happens with the low vibration foods, especially if they are like mineral based, um, they're just gonna go get deposited and sit in our body somewhere. They sit in our joints, we have arthritis, they build bone spurs on our heels, <laughs> things like this. But if instead we take it from an organic source or a living high vibration source, <clears throat> if we take it from a plant that has uptaken the minerals from the soil and put it in a package that is now organic and full of life, and we put that in our body, our body knows exactly what to do with it. It's not hard. It takes it in it assimilates it and it puts it exactly where it's supposed to be. And it's a lot less work. <laughs> so that's organic versus inorganic. Um, then we have wholesome versus part some. <laughs> yes. Just to clarify, I mean, it wouldn't seem like there'd be very many opportunities for us to eat inorganic food, right? Unless you're referring to the dead food as being inorganic. 
like the and the hamburger, and the most of no right and signature. and most of the supplements on the market and, okay. okay if if they're not a a wholesome dried herb you know if it's calcium from eggshells or vitamin a from carrots like okay it was from a carrot but it's no longer anything like a carrot um and it's very hard for your body to use yeah but uh, from that classification with the hamburger and the bun be considered organic or inorganic? i'm just curious i'm oh, sorry for yeah, I, I would, I would classify that as inorganic because it is that lower vibration. It depends on how it's done. Like the fast food industry puts a lot of stuff that's not meat. <laughs> and so, so, it's scary. so if it's, uh, if it's grass fed beef, there is a difference between like a hundred percent grass fed beef mm -hmm. and <clears throat> what you would buy even at the, you know, at the grocery store or at um, a fast food for sure. They, they put in all these fillers mm -hmm. and stuff that it's, it's not, it's not meat. Mm -hmm. it's a, they put some meat in there, but it's, I, I don't know what the percentages are, but I think they're more and more less meat and less meat as they are. Yeah. I saw this one um, video one time and they had a McDonald's hamburger, just meat mm -hmm. and just, uh, a hamburger that was homemade and, and it was just meat by a, a cow that had been grass fed and stuff. Mm -hmm. So the, the the regular meat, the one that was grass fed, it, it uh, dissolved fast. Mm -hmm. but the other one, because they had so many weird things in it, I mean, three weeks later, it still looked the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it was not. And like the form of, like, so how the raise. I'm saying in general, like, mm -hmm. like small farmers might do things differently, hopefully better. Mm -hmm. But like how we do our agricultural too is we give them um, antibiotics and mm -hmm. them, uh, vaccines and like all the stuff that has and growth uh, hormones, toxic loads. And so, so we we change, like even I mean not yeah. even just the food they eat, but the all the stuff that we're putting in their body yeah. does change. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, and so I, I used to be very on the Weston A. Price tra train, and if I'm going to do animal products, it's going to be grass-fed, pasture-raised, small-farmed, etc. This is where I get a little unpopular <laughs> They teach what Dr. Christopher teaches, is that even so, yes, that's better, but even so, it's literally dead meat. <laughs> And it still has residues of whatever toxins were in that blood of the animal. Um, and this is um, what I was going to get to in a little bit is, so when we come to the cleansing portion, even if we ate perfectly clean diet and we lived in the perfectly clean environment, our bodies all the time are running the program and they produce cellular waste. And that has to leave if we're going to stay healthy. And so even if we're bringing in everything good and living in a perfect environment, our bloodstream still has toxins in it that need to get out. And so we're going to talk about what to do about that. Um, but let's come back to wholesome versus part some. And so this is um, similar to organic and inorganic in in the sense of, um, you know, the wholesome foods, it's going to be like a whole apple you know, or raw celery or a whole grain, especially if it's sprouted. Um, a part, some food would be like white flour, <laughs> right? Like we've clearly taken off the bran and the, what was it? The hole in the kernel. I get it. Yeah. The germ. There we go. The bran and the germ, um, which have most of the nutrition that is in wheat itself. Um, and, and that's where it's, it's so, I mean, it's almost comical when you think about, you know, like where the word of wisdom says wheat for the man. And yet so many people are allergic to wheat products now, but again, wheat products, <laughs> we've grown up and inundated ourselves with so many parts some wheat foods that now our bodies can't even recognize a wholesome wheat food. And we have to heal our gut before we can even dream of digesting wheat again. Some people. 
Um, and some people believe they, they can't their whole lives. It's just because you know, that's what the doctor says. Well, it's genetic and you just can't do it. <laughs> I beg to differ and I want people to try so I can know. <laughs> anyway, so, so those are some quick examples. Um, and then other parts, some foods, protein powder. Um, there's a lot of supplements out there that are touted as being so healthy. Um, protein powder has plenty of studies around it being really not good for you. <laughs> um, now, if you were to take whole hemp seeds and just grind them up and use that as your protein powder that you're adding to smoothie or food or whatever, that's great because it was, it was a wholesome food. Does the grinding oxidize it a little bit? Yeah. Does it remove some nutrients? Yeah. But is it better to have that than not have them at all? Yeah, <laughs> in my opinion. Um, but when we're looking at isolated substances like soy protein isolate and, um, you know, what are, what are some of the others? Like, oh, the, the B vitamins are, are some of the worst. Let's see. Um, I'm sorry, I can't think of the exact names, but if you look at like the chemical names of the B vitamins that are added to so many foods, um, it's, not, it's not part of anything. Um, and it's either been extracted or isolated from a plant or been completely synthesized to look like the same chemical. And our body just, it doesn't recognize it as the same. Now, do we, I know in my life, I've experienced some short-term benefit from taking Flintstone vitamins that I grew up with. Like I do know that I was sick less often when I was taking my vitamins, but the long term is we've put all those inorganic chemicals in our body that are now causing congestion and things are stuck. <laughs> and so do I, do I believe in taking supplements? Yes, I do. But I believe in taking them in the, as close to nature as possible. So we get our herbal teas or we get our, um, <clears throat> you know, powdered herb supplements that are still the herb, not a, not a concentrate or an isolate or something like this. And those are really the ones that when the FDA says this herb is dangerous, it's because they tested one of those where it's just one constituent part of that herb. It's no longer with all the other things that we haven't even found ways to measure everything that's in, you know, a single red raspberry leaf. And a lot of those things, you'll have one toxic substance and you'll have another constituent that counteracts it. It makes it safe. So if you have the whole thing, you're good. <laughs> okay. So that's a bit unwholesome and partsome. There is so much to talk about. <laughs> All right. So the mucusless diet. So I, I get this question a lot. Wait, mucusless, don't we need mucus? Yes. <laughs> you need a certain level of mucus. It has a role in the body. Um, but it's the excessive mucus that leads to disease because that is what the bacteria are feeding on. It is what clogs up our arteries. It's what clogs up our intestines. So we can't even absorb the food that we're putting in so, so carefully. Um, and so this diet intends to not, not add to that, not add to the mucus. Your body can create the perfect amount of mucus without needing to take in mucus forming foods. And so this is the diet that he found, um, helped people heal the most. And then we'll talk a little bit, a little bit, you know, when you need, um, some extra cleansing. And so he recommended fresh fruits and vegetables as much raw as possible, um, whole grains, which have been soaked and sprouted or soaked and low heated, nuts, seeds, and legumes. And same with those, soaked, sprouted, low heated are, are, are good too. Um, and he recommended like 50% like raw food is good for most people. Like 50% raw, 50% cooked is okay. And it's gonna depend on your constitution, um, what your tendencies are like, um, some of us need heavier, heavier, more cooked foods. Some of us need more raw foods and that might change throughout your lifetime, what you need as well. And so that's the general advice there and seasonally. Yes, please. Oh, under 130 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the number that's coming to mind. <laughs> 
So when he would make broth or cook something, you would want to keep it under 130 F and um, you would want to cook it low and slow. And like, even when you're boiling something, you want it to just barely bubble. And again, this is ideal. <laughs> There's plenty of people that heal even from cancer just by cutting out certain things and they still eat normally cooked rice, normally cooked beans. They're not soaking in low heating. They're just cooking it in the instant pot and eating it and it's fine. But if you had a condition where, or you were, you were very sensitive, um, you had a lot of, you know, inherited stuff that was, was difficult to work with this, this is supposed to be the most assimilable set of foods. <laughs> um, and the other thing is that whether you are underweight or overweight, this program is supposed to bring you to where your perfect happy body <laughs> wants to be um, while providing all the nutrients that you need. Um, and so, so that's the base of it. Those are the do's. Um, and then I always add in there, like load up with tons of greens and chlorophyll. Um, and one thing that I've found in terms of like, um, soap sprouted, low heated food. Um, sometimes when I, like, if I do that for my kids that it's so, okay, let's see, I have like, a, a simmered bowl of buckwheat groats or oats. Let's do oats. Most people know that one. <laughs> so like oat groats, I've simmered them until they're nice and soft. You know, the, the grain is exploded and it's nice and soft and mushy and, and everyone can eat it. Great. Um, if I soak and low heat that it's much chewier, um, which encourages you to mix your saliva with it a lot more, which is really, really important for digestion. Um, but I have noticed that sometimes it goes right through my kids. <laughs> and so in that case, I will either blend it first or just cook it more for them. So it's something just to keep in mind. It's supposed to be the most digestible form, but if it's not digesting, cook it longer. <laughs> that's, that's the wor world according to Sarah, not Dr. Christopher. So maybe, I don't know, maybe the graders will be angry that I said that. I don't know. <laughs> Um, okay. So those are the do's. Okay. The don'ts are anything that adds mucus in the body or constipates us in some way. And so Dr. Christopher talked about constipation all the time. <laughs> it's like, you have got to be moving your bowels. Um, and of course that is one of the primary ways that we remove those toxins and, or just cellular waste products from our body every day. Yeah. Okay, so I have a problem with um, either I'm constipated or I'm very runny. Uh -huh. So what am I eating that's causing that problem? <laughs> so I, I, it's complicated. Yeah. I mean, I would need to like see a list of, of what you're eating, but the other thing is that our, our stress has a lot to do with our digestion. It's very connected, right? Yeah. Um, and so that's one thing I wanted to say is like, this is, I've been practicing this program for like two and a half years and I'm still not perfect. Sometimes I still cook my stuff dead. Like it's, it's what I know how to do. Um, and, and so I'm not, I'm not perfect. Um, and no matter what I do food wise, herb wise, and the other modalities that we'll talk about in a minute, um, if I'm stressed, like <laughs> it don't matter, but it does help to be taking in the right nutrients because of course, stress burns our nutrients even faster than our normal metabolism. Um, so that's one, one answer to that. The other thing is that sometimes diarrhea can actually be the extreme end of constipation because our body can't get it out. And so finally it's just like, okay. <laughs> and whatever can squeeze out past, you know, whatever's blocking, um, is what comes out super pleasant topics. Um, the other thing is many of us have inflamed bowels these days, right? Um, and what are the primary causes of that sugars, processed food, um, overuse of salt, 
Um, the only salt I recommend is uh, a good sea salt like Redmond. Um, or <clears throat> like Dr. Christopher actually recommended not using salt at all. Um, but uh, when I asked the school about this, I was like, so would he really not recommend, you know, sea salt or Redmond salt? And, and they said, well, it wasn't really available in his day. The only stuff that was available in his day was the iodized salt, which has everything good processed out of it. And then it adds inorganic iodine. <laughs> and we can get iodine from kelp and dulse and seaweed instead. Um, and when we take those, we're also getting zinc and we're getting potassium and all the other minerals that come with that. And that actually helps build um, the right balance of stomach acid when we have the right kind of zinc in our bodies. Um, <clears throat> and so let, let me get back to the, so these are the constipating foods. <laughs> and it is dairy, even raw dairy, <laughs> um, meat, even grass-raised meat, eggs, sugar, white flour, and processed food. So I, I do recommend, you know, if you're going to keep eating anything on that list, obviously try to get the highest form that you can that's been raised right. Um, but especially if you, if you were very sick and trying to overcome something, um, this is what Dr. Christopher found helped the most. Eliminate the foods that cause constipation. Get in your fresh fruits and vegetables, get things moving again. And there's many herbs that can help get things move, get things moving. Um, the other thing um, besides just bowel inflammation is many of us are peristaltic muscles that actually, let's see, which way does it go? This way, <laughs> that actually contract and move food through the intestines. For many of us, they're, they don't work anymore. We've just lost those. <laughs> that ability because we've eaten food that just has to be like cranked through the system for so long. And so um, there's an herb combination that, that I've really enjoyed and it's Dr. Christopher's lower bowel formula. And it not only acts, yes, yes. And it is, can I just say, it is so satisfactory to have like a large comfortable bowel movement, <laughs> which should be happening at least three times a day, according to Dr. Christopher. All the doctors have different ideas of what that should be. That's what he found led to good health. Um, but yeah, it's really satisfying when you don't have to strain, <laughs> so you don't have to have hemorrhoids, or you don't have to race to the bathroom because it's going to come out like a flood of diarrhea. Um, and so that formula not only acts as a laxative, but it also repairs the peristaltic muscles. Formula yeah, Dr. Christopher's lower bowel formula. Um, and it also has some things in it that help with the liver and gallbladder um, and just this whole area. Um, there's so many other things I could talk about. <laughs> yes, and that's, that's my next topic. <laughs> The excess mucus test for eating animal products and processed foods. And mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. And and sugar and um yeah anything processed anything partsome and inorganic that we've talked about, and then there's the environmental stuff, um, which I could talk more over like four more lectures, but <laughs> anything that's coming into our body that our body has to that it recognizes as invader or poison it has to do something with it. And often we'll just like, you know, capture it with mucus. And so it'll, it'll create extra mucus to take care of it. Um, and so that's when we end up with, you know, our chronic ear infections and our chronic sinus infections, asthma, that's mucus in the lungs, super fun. And when people, um, there's, a, there's a special protocol that Dr. Christopher used when people were in an asthmatic fit, you can actually heal asthma during that crisis of an asthmatic fit, if you use the right herbs. And basically you're triggering the body to vomit it all out, but somehow the body knows not to vomit the stomach contents, but to just vomit all the mucus that's been stuck in the lungs for years, causing that asthmatic condition. And it comes out like green and black and nasty, <laughs> which is like gross, but wow, you could be done with asthma in, in one night, you know? What did you say you take for that? And um, so that, 
you would do peppermint, warm peppermint tea first to open everything up. And then you would dose with lobelia tincture. And the dosage depends on the size of the person, but basically you take very small amounts until, well, <laughs> it's a, small is relative. If you're trying to induce vomiting, you take larger amounts. You would do like a teaspoon to a tablespoon at a time, like every 15 minutes until it comes out. Um, now, and I don't know personally, like how long you would try that if nothing happened when to stop because all this, all the case studies that I've read, it just, it happens within 15 minutes, you know? <laughs> um, but, but so that's a fascinating one um, that mucus gets stuck in our lungs. And so then of course our, our breathing capacity is impaired. And if our breathing capacity is impaired, we're not getting enough oxygen in, we're not getting enough CO2 out. Um, it's just another place of constipation. <laughs> it just happens to be with different muscles and, and air. Um, okay. I was going to say one more thing on that. Um, oh, and then the other place. So in the bowels, um, what they've found is that I think, I think it was John Wayne was the example, like when they autopsied John Wayne, they found like inches of just thick stuck on mucus that was just nasty. So what happens is when mucus forms because of the things we've talked about, um, it, the water dehydrates out of that mucus and it forms a very thin, very sticky layer. And it just keeps building unless we do something about it. And so that's the lower bowel formula also breaks that up and gets it coming out. Um, and, but when you have all those layers of sticky mucus, you're not getting the nutrients from your food. You're getting very, very little out of it, which I remember, oh, years of going to different like natural healthcare practitioners. And one of them finally said like, well, your digestion is so bad. You're not getting anything out of these $200 of supplements a month that you're taking. And I was just like, all right, not doing that anymore. <laughs> um, and so along with the lower bowel formula, that's usually like the first step um, that I recommend for people. The second one um, is to soothe that irritation, um, especially if you tend more towards, you know, the runny end than the hard constipated end. But if you alternate, it's still, this is still good. Um, so I do a mixture of slippery elm powder and licorice root powder. It's about three to one, um, like by weight. And you mix a little bit of cold water and licorice root. So you mix a little bit of cold water into that and then you add warm water to it and you can keep it really thick like a, like a breakfast gruel. I know you've eaten it that way. Um, or you can thin it out so that it's more of a tea. And um, if you sip that through the day or even just eat it once a day, it just goes in there and starts soothing everything and, and rebuilding everything. and um, it also draws poisons out with it. So that's one um, that I keep on hand for any time I think someone has food poisoning or tummy flu or just any like major uh, digestive upset. It's a very soothing food that usually doesn't come back up if you're having trouble keeping things down. So, so when you say three, you want three parts of three on to one part of three. Yeah. Yeah. And you can weigh it out or you can do three teaspoons to one teaspoon. Like either one is fine. It's, it's not like you're playing with something very dangerous and, you know, <laughs> um, <clears throat> so that's really good. And the licorice root is a gentle laxative and also helps uh, balance your hormones a little bit among other things. So, so that's a nice one. Oh, and it, it sweetens it up just a little bit. Okay. So all right, so we are almost at 11 o'clock. Oh my gosh. Okay, so let me talk about distilled water. <laughs> I need another hour. I don't think, I don't know how they thought I'd get through all this. Okay, um, so, so the water that Dr. Christopher recommends, and this is really interesting because he, he was big on, a, the average adult should be drinking a gallon of water a day, which again, a lot of the things I'm sharing, I know you've heard different opinions on. <laughs> 
Um, but this is, he had so many years of actually healing people that I, I'm inclined to, to at least test his principles, um, rather than say, oh, well, this study said something else, you know, that's my opinion. Um, but, but then you also adjust that by, um, by your, your size. And so, um, like 128 ounces is a gallon, right? And so that approximately correlates to like a hundred thirty pound person, um, which doesn't sound like the average adult. Maybe like hundred thirty to hundred fifty. So it's approximately like the number of pounds you are. That's the number of ounces of, of water that you should be drinking, approximately, <laughs> which is a lot. Um, but that can also be. Um, you know, you can work up to that number with herbal teas or fresh juices, um, but that is like the amount of liquid that you're shooting for in a day. Yes. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> At first, you definitely would be. Um, your body should should adjust, and especially if you are making sure that you're getting your minerals in with herbal teas and things like that, and your foods. Um, that should start. To balance things out, um, but yeah, that that is the first thing that people worry about, <laughs> which understandably <laughs> you got stuff to do, right? Um, but all that water is going to, you know, provide water for your blood. It's going to get water for your tissues. We use water for so much in our bodies, um, and then it's also just going to flush everything out in a good way. <laughs> um, and he. So it was like years into his career um, and he struggled with um, some conditions that he was born with, very difficult ones, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, um, hardening of the arteries. I think he had that when he was a teenager already. And, um, and that's why he <laughs> discovered this, this diet and this healing system and the juices and the herbs and everything. But um, he just happened upon one day someone said, Hey, like, have you ever checked out distilled water? And it was, Oh no, like distilled water that it leaches the minerals from your body and flushes them out. We don't want to do that. Well, actually the reason that there's lots of minerals in your urine when you drink distilled water is because it's finding those inorganic deposits in your joints and anywhere else where what you've taken in that was, you know, rock-based, <laughs> all those Flintstone vitamins, it's flushing those out, but it leaves your bones alone. It does not take the calcium out of your bones. <laughs> and so he experienced dramatic improvement just switching to distilled water. Now, a way that you can amplify that process of removing the inorganic deposits while also helping your digestion is that at least three times a day, you have your eight ounce glass of distilled water and you put um, a tablespoon or a few tablespoons of raw apple cider vinegar. And you can put a tablespoon of honey in with that and you can drink it down or you can sip it, whatever suits your, your tastes and your temperament. Um, and that is gonna help your, your stomach um, <laughs> create just the right amount of stomach acid to break down your food. So you're getting the nutrients there. And it's also, um, have you ever used vinegar to clean out like a glass jar or a teapot? Yeah. It, it just breaks it right up. So it does that in those, the stuff in your joints that shouldn't be there. If you take that into your body. So you're saying a tablespoon a day? Three times a day. Three times a day. With a cup of water or two mm -hmm. You can adjust it to your uh, cider uh, apple cider vinegar. Yeah. You want it raw with the mother because then it also has prebiotics and probiotics. So really, really good stuff. And I'm going over and I'm trying really hard not to. Um, I find that distilled water is really hard to get. And so personally, I've used reverse osmosis water and I have a little under counter filter for my trailer. Um, and it's, it's pretty close. Is it perfect? No, but is it way better than drinking the well water? Yes. <laughs> um, it was interesting um, because I, there, you know, there's history of, you know, the magical springs that heal people, you know, drink the magical spring water and it's got all the minerals and it's wonderful. And Dr. Christopher said, there are a few where 
the minerals in the water are in an organic form. But the majority of the springs and the well water, it is inorganic minerals in that water, and it is going to be over time a net problem in your body. Um, so I know that's not popular since we're all on wells, but the RO system that we have was fairly affordable. I think it was under $200 um, and should last a long, long time. So you think about how much you spend on medical costs. <laughs> uh huh. Uh huh. I don't like it as well as my under like at our grass but also have it under mouth. Uh -huh. But it works. Yeah. yeah, and you can get the nice thing is you can fill the thing really full, like um because like we had a zero water filter for a while and that goes so so um, but um but this one, I mean there's some benefits in it, but how it does it, I don't know. It's not my favorite. Mm. But you can get the Okay. Yeah. And I, I haven't seen under counter, um, like trailer size under counter, yeah. um, water distillers, but you can get home water distillers. And that is our intent when we have our house and we have room for a unit like that. I just have a really, this is kind of an odd question, but it, it seems like if we were living way closer to the earth, you know, the way we God intended us to, mm -hmm. Um, the water would be minerals. There would be a lot of minerals in the water. Because yeah. where would you ever find distilled water? Rain. But most people survive on like springs or wells mm -hmm. or running water. Mm -hmm. or, I mean, Yeah. So what Dr. Christopher said was the, you know, what the animals look for is the fresh rain. They know that's the better water. Now, these days, the rain comes down through the atmosphere and gets all kinds of junk in it. So we just don't have good natural water anymore. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, and, and in one way, it's if, if I think about it, it's like it's really not natural to dig 200 feet into the ground and drink that water. Um, shallow wells in some areas, like, I guess that makes sense, but really like catching the rainwater or having a running spring. I'm thinking of like Jacob's well. I'm thinking about all the times when, when people, that, that's what created the community is they, they had it, there was a spring or a well, mm -hmm. there was water coming up out of the ground that mm -hmm. they rely on. They didn't have to rely on right. it raining. Yeah. It, it, and, and some of them, like, like I said, he said, some of them are organic, but at least the ones that he investigated in his lifetime, most of them were not. So said, or running water as in screen. Or yeah. Yeah. It, it just depends. And maybe the earth has changed over time. Like I, there's a lot of factors there. I just know I felt way better drinking distilled or RO water. Um, so that's what I have to share. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Did you have a question, Jill? Oh, okay. Okay. So um, I'm going to try to zip through that. Do you mind if I take a little extra time? Okay. Because I, I feel bad cutting anything short here because it's, it's just so much, right? It's just so much. Like, it's not as simple as saying, you know, Dr. Christopher says everyone should be vegan. Cause it's not that simple. Like we need to talk about wholesome foods <laughs> and, um, and, and how to prepare them so that they have the most nutrients. But then also, um, like I said, like our bodies are so broken down and clogged up. We've inherited so much that we, it's our opportunity to heal what the previous generations have given us, um, and not be bitter about it. <laughs> And of course that goes for our thoughts and our emotions, um, which I talk about a little bit later here. Okay. So a few more things that he recommends, um, on the diet. So this is what he calls his supplements. And so cayenne, cayenne, let me count the ways. Um, it is a gentle laxative. Well, it sizzles a little on the way out. Um, <laughs> you can feel the heat, but here's the thing about cayenne. It's not actually damaging tissue. It feels uncomfortable, but it's not damaging. And that's what's very different about herbs. And, and many people like to say, oh, well, 
I felt this. And so the herb was killing me. And it's like, no, it was healing you. It just wasn't comfortable. Right. And a lot of us don't want to be uncomfortable. Um, cayenne is one of those that you have to be okay with a little discomfort if you want to use it, but it does help as a, a mild laxative. It actually feeds the heart. So it's very good for anyone with a weak cardiovascular or heart system. Um, it balances your blood pressure either direction. If you've got low blood pressure, put some cayenne tea in your mouth. It'll balance right out. If you've got high blood pressure, cayenne tea in your mouth balances it out. And on that note, it can stop hemorrhaging. Yes, it stops hemorrhaging and yeah, cayenne pepper. Um, and if I keep cayenne tincture available in case anyone I love has a heart attack, squirt it in their mouth, <laughs> repeat as needed. Um, yeah, he, Dr. Christopher never lost a patient administering cayenne pepper after when they were having a heart attack. So it's powerful stuff. Um, would I tell you not to go to the ER? No, I can't tell you that. Like you got, you got to follow the spirit, but cayenne pepper and a priest of blessing. <laughs> that would be my first response. <laughs> um, all right. Um, so it's also very stimulating to the organs. So Dr. Christopher put it in most of his um, herbal blends because it just stimulates and drives the herbs where they need to go. Um, and it actually helps eliminate cholesterol. It helps rebuild varicose conditions. Um, and if you sprinkle it on your food, um, it helps create the right balance of HCL. <laughs> yeah. And so, so if you're looking for like keeping your blood pressure balanced and these other like cardiovascular things, taking it in a capsule so that you're not feeling the heat quite as much, although you got to drink a lot of water or it like opens up right here and it's like, <laughs> I always take it and then take some food or like a lot of warm water. Um, but if you want the digestive benefits of the cayenne, you got to sprinkle it on your food. You got to taste it. And that goes for pretty much any herb that helps a digestive complaint. You got to taste it. <laughs> um, and it helps with other things. Of course, I know we've talked about this. Tasting the herb is often part of the medicine, um, but there's some bitter herbs that you can still get the benefit. Maybe not quite as, quite as potently um, if you just can't handle taste. We'd rather get it in then, you know, oh, it has to be this way. <laughs> the, bitter, the bitter is something that like in Ayurvedic and, and look, you're more Eastern Indian areas mm -hmm. and stuff. They, they eat a lot of bitter food. Yeah, and our, pungent. Our, our American taste buds that they, we've actually been so wow. perverted yeah. to not be able to handle a bitter flavor. Yeah, we're missing the bitter and the pungent flavors mm -hmm. in our diet for sure. Yeah. Um, Dr. Christopher recommended um, olive oil. We would want cold pressed organic. Um, how much you need really depends on the person. Very young, very active people tend to need more oil. I need a lot of oil, um, but I know there's a lot of people who've done like whole foods, plant-based, no oil and feel much better without the oil. So that's just something for you to figure out on your own. Um, but the, you know, the school has taught that that olive oil is extremely nourishing. Um, they have some great stories of, there was this one baby that couldn't, couldn't nurse, was born really prematurely. And back then they didn't have a way to get stuff into the baby. And the grandmother said, I'll take the baby home with me and, and he'll live. And every day she massaged olive oil into the baby. And that baby lived on external application of olive oil until he was about 18 and then some new medical surgery was available to fix something and he got that and then he didn't have nearly as good health <laughs> as when he was just fed on olive oil massage. So like crazy, right? 18 years. 18 years. <laughs> it sounds so unbelievable. I, I want to have the experience myself so I can be like, yes, I've seen it with my own eyes, but also that's a lot of work, right? Sometimes that's a lot of work, but if it works, could it be worth it? And so that's really a question I ask often is like, what are you willing to do, you know, to feel better? And what are you willing to experience? Are you willing to be a little extra uncomfortable for a few weeks? Um, are you willing to put in a little extra work? Um, and, and again, all, any healing I recommend, you know, consulting with the big man. <laughs> Um, they really know, I, um, 
yeah, our heavenly parents really know what exactly what we need at what time. Um, and, you know, I know that there's some people who have, have decided that the only thing they can digest is like meat, you know, like the carnivore diet. It's the only thing I can eat that doesn't make me sick. Um, and, uh, what I believe can be done in that situation, this, this diet didn't really exist in Dr. Christopher's time. So he doesn't talk about moving people over from that, but that's where, again, we do the lower bowel, we repair the bowel, we repair the digestion, we do the slippery elm to heal it all. And then we start reintroducing things. That's my theory. Um, <laughs> and I hope someone will give it a try sometime. Um, because again, this diet is, is supposedly the most mild and uh, digestible, assimilable, um, diet out there. Um, so if you do that diet, do you think it will repair the liver and the gallbladder and the pancreas? And yeah. Um, happen to do the cleanse? I would still, if you had issues in those areas, I would still take herbs specific for those areas to rebuild them. And, you know, it's interesting because I, I'm the type of, like, I have lived through a lot of toxic conditions. <laughs> and, um, and so I am a little bit unhealthily obsessed with cleansing. I'll admit it. And, um, <laughs> but, you know, if you look at my body type, like I, I need to bring more in than I'm taking out, but I'm a little obsessed with getting things out. Um, and so, um, I've been playing with like, okay, I need to repair the function of my body, but the way I do that is this cleanse where I'm working through the lower bowel, the liver, gallbladder, the kidneys and bladder and um, my bloodstream. Like I want to clean it out, but also I want to rebuild those areas. And so the first time I did the cleanse, I was very much like I'm cleansing. But the second time I just have the attitude of I'm just rebuilding. Okay. And so I don't have to think of this as a cleanse. I'm just herbally supporting those areas. Um, and so a, a lot of it, <laughs> you know, goes on here and here. Um, and it's our intention. And I always recommend, you know, saying a prayer um, to confirm that the herb that you've chosen or the combination or, or method that you've chosen um, is the right one. And also say a prayer that, you know, it will be used for your highest good and, and all that. Um, I found a lot of power that way. Um, okay, the only other oil that he directly recommends is wheat germ oil. And that one he recommends, and many people know it's high in vitamin E, um, that helps it balance our hormones and it is actually regenerative for the body. So he recommended people that need a lot of rebuilding or have very weak bodies or very diseased um, take wheat germ oil like up to three times a day, a little spoonful. It tastes disgusting. I got used to it. <laughs> I didn't think I ever would. You can get capsules. It's just cheaper to get it in like a, a bottle that you pour onto a spoon, but it does taste gross. <laughs> Those are the only two he recommends. He doesn't like I personally think there are a few other plant oils that if they are cold pressed and organic, they are okay. Um, but those are the two that he focuses on. Um, okay, blackstrap molasses uh, is really high in iron and in minerals. So that- I love you for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that one is really, really beneficial. Um, molasses is high in what? Iron and minerals, again, in that organic form. Um, is it a little processed? Yes, uh, but he found that it, it helped a lot of people. Um, and we've, okay, we've talked about the apple cider vinegar and water. We've talked about seaweed. Um, like I said, that supplies iodine and zinc, really important for your digestion, really important for your thyroid. Kelp also cleanses the arteries and tones the walls of the blood vessels. And you can get it in just like a little dried sprinkle form. You can get kelp seasoning. You just want to check the label that it doesn't have weird stuff added to it. It generally doesn't, but um, you just want kelp or maybe kelp with sea salt and other culinary herbs. Sometimes you can get that. Um, and it, it's good for supplying iodine and zinc. So digestion and thyroid and for your arteries and vessels. 
Um, I also really like, and my kids love like that dried seaweed. <laughs> oh, I, I love it's that. so good. Um, and I try to get the kind, I forget what oil it's in. It's probably best to get it without any oil, but I'm trying to think, I might've found it with olive oil. Well, anyway, just pay attention. I wouldn't get anything that's in like canola oil. Um, I think it can be made in a healthy way, but it would be very hard to find and probably not what's in. Well, yeah. Um, I lived in Japan for three years. Uh -huh. and I ate a lot of seaweed. Yeah. Um, everything they have has seaweed. It's wrapped around the rice, uh -huh. it's wrapped around their cookies. Um, and I just ate a lot of it when I came home. I, I got so I loved it. And so I bought it. I would just uh, uh, put it over the furnace and just eat it. <laughs> and when I when I got menopause, I had no hot flashes. Uh -huh. And um, the women in Japan don't have hot flashes. Yeah. So I just wonder, I just wanted to know that it, was that because I was absolutely. Pregnant? Yeah. Yeah. When you get all those minerals in your body your hormonal systems work so much better. Yeah, we don't have to experience puberty and menopause and even postpartum the way that we're used to, just feeling awful. <laughs> um, so yeah, kelp, kelp is great. I love hearing that. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> All right, so let's just do a few minutes. Um, we've kind of integrated the Q&A. Um, all right, and if anyone, uh, those of you on Zoom, if you wanna send any questions to the chat, let me know. I'm gonna try to close at 11.30. <laughs> Classic me, it's half an hour after the <laughs> closing time. Okay, um, so let's talk about cleansing for a little bit. Okay, I already gave the intro that even if we were perfect in what we ate and what was around us, we still have toxins to get out. So does anyone know what the four channels of elimination are? Mm -hmm. What are they? Sweat, uh -huh. pee, and breath. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yep. So it's our bowels, it's our urinary system, it's our skin through the sweating, and it's our lungs through the coughing and the breathing. So yeah. what was it the Sweat, pee, poop, breath. <laughs> I like those breath. terms. Breath. <laughs> I mean, your breasts do detox, but <laughs> that's, yeah, maybe that's like the fifth one for women, but um, it depends on the thing. Some things are easier to get out one way or the other, or it just depends on which system is most clogged for you. Um, so that's one of the first things we look at is, are those four channels open? Yeah, so it's like the nose. The nose. Yeah, I'm, I'm just calling the whole respiratory. respiratory. Yeah. Um, so we've talked about the lower bowel formula and what it does. Um, there is a kidney and bladder formula um, that restores and tones the organs of the urinary, the urinary system the whole way through. And um, I feel like that's the one that I've recommended to people the most often. I feel like most often people come to me with urinary problems in the last year. And so anything from stones to UTIs to yeast infections have used this formula and it's helped. It's, yeah, it's the one you've used. <laughs> it's the kidney bladder formula of Dr. Christopher's. Yeah. Um, so that one's really nice. And you can, um, as I said, you know, to Jill's question, you can totally take that formula. Even if you don't have any issues, you could take it for about six weeks. Just follow the dosage on the bottle just to tune up, tune up your system, um, and make sure that your urinary tract is, is working. <laughs> All right. So we got the bowels working. We've got the, the urine working, um, for skin. Um, I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. Um, so sweating, so exercise is a powerful form of detox, um, also because of the breathing, right? We're getting a lot more oxygen in, we're getting a lot more breath out, and we're sweating. And I recently learned that sweat, <laughs> I love that you smile whenever, um, <laughs> sweat is not only like pulling toxins out and putting them on the surface, there's also components of that sweat 
that work to disinfect any pathogens that are on our skin. Crazy, right? Because I always think, oh, I sweat. It's all toxic junk. I need to wash it off right away. And I still think you, that you should cleanse after you sweat. Um, but, but yeah, it has more than one purpose. Fascinating. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's, um, so that, so that is the, a, a big benefit. So when we do our, our fever bath and, and drinks, we're not only helping to incubate, you know, and mobilize our immune system, but we are also sweating out the toxins. And then, um, <clears throat> It's funny because the anatomy textbook I was just reading, they were like, oh yeah, like here's the functions of sweat. But also science has found that it's not really a good detox system like everyone says in the alternative health world. And I'm just like, that's funny because <laughs> Dr. Christopher had this method called a, a cold sheet treatment where um, the, the full program is for people that are like on death's door if it's appropriate for them. But especially if they had a fever, you do an enema, because it's an emergency, you get the bowels open, you put them in a hot bath, you drink the hot herbs, um, the herbal tea, and then you get them out of the bath, you wrap them in a cold sheet, a cold, wet sheet, and you put them to bed covered in blankets. And they sweat, 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 sweat all night. They sweat so much, they don't have to get up and pee. And then in the morning, they're better. <laughs> they just drink some juice and go along their merry lives. Um, and this has been used also to help people stop smoking and pull all that tar and junk out of their bodies. And when they wake up in the morning and you look at that sheet, it's all different colors. So clearly our skin does get rid of junk <laughs> through sweat. Um, I just had to like stick it to the part of that book. Okay, um, alternating, alternating hot and cold therapy. Um, so the cold sheet treatment kind of does that, but also we can um, get a lot of benefit also for our nervous system um, by taking alternating hot showers and cold showers or alternating hot baths and cold baths. My son does that. <laughs> he puts the water on, on, on hot uh -huh. and then and he's showering and then he turns it all off and it's just cold. Mm -hmm. it's yep. Yes, I do that sometimes. That's what, that's what, um, Dr. Neil Medley recommends for people with depression. Uh -huh. They actually say we should be taking it. We should be in the shower and cold every day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, if, if we're that great. Yeah. <laughs> I just can't do it. Yeah. That's what I said until someone was just like, you're going to do this. <laughs> and I did it. And I've kept doing it. I've only missed like five days in the last nine months. And I tell you, the days that I don't get my cold shower, Mm -hmm. yeah and you and you ease into it as well um that's right that's right <laughs> yes um anyway and so that opens opens up the pores obviously the cold closes it back up again but you know we we open and close and open and close and it conditions the, the skin and also the nervous system very very much so it gets right into the hypothalamus the pituitary and everything um very powerful stuff and it at the end of it you should feel a rush of energy that lasts several hours yeah it's amazing <laughs> i feel superhuman every morning i do it and then the days i forget i'm like what happened oh <laughs> i didn't shower um another thing i love to do after my my showers is dry skin brushing and so you get a, a brush they have some are softer that you you ideally get like as coarse as you can handle and you're brushing towards your heart all up your body towards your heart you said dry brushing. Mm -hmm. and so you're doing a little bit of exfoliation you're doing a little bit of stimulating circulation back to your skin because when you're in the cold shower, it's going to your organs, right? You're like deeply nourishing those organs, but then you want your blood to come back out to your skin to warm you up. Um, but then it's also moving lymph fluid. And lymph, the lymphatic system is one of the ways that our bodies carry, pull the toxins from our different tissues and then get them to where they can be eliminated. So we want that to be moving. And that's another reason why toward the heart. Yeah, because that's where it all ends up. <laughs> um, and also, that's why exercise is so beneficial as well, especially if we're like jumping on a rebounder. I think there's one in the corner there. Um, or trampoline and, and exercising moves that lymph around. Yes. I, I was watching one skin brushing thing and they said that you kind of 
kick the diaphragm and cut it in half. And so the upper part of the body you bring towards the lungs and the heart. Uh -huh. The lower part, yes, you bring towards the body. And end here? Uh -huh. Do they do a circle around here? Yeah, and, and so that you're actually, the lower part of the body, you're actually sprinkling the toxins sweet out through the body rather than that kind of makes sense yeah and i what i generally do is i i pull it up here and then i kind of circle around the bowel and then i i just kind of brushed it up here and then everything else i take to the heart so it's i mean it's close yeah. enough <laughs> yeah they took skin brushing to a whole new level oh i bet yeah there's really cool stuff out there i also like gua sha a lot it's an ancient beauty technique for your face building collagen. <laughs> I need to get back to doing it. It's relaxing too. Um, one of my favorites. So it, you can use the back of a spoon or a, or a knife, like the soft part and, and rub like just here over your, your third eye area. And it's super relaxing for your whole body <laughs> and breathe deeply while you do it. Anyway, off topic. Um, okay. How else do we keep our skin open as an elimination organ? Um, natural fiber clothing which is a really hard one these days because the cheap clothing is plastic. <laughs> um, yeah, cotton, linen, wool, silk. Um, so, you know, we'll grow more mulberry trees and we'll have a silk farm. <laughs> um, so what I look for is at least 50% natural fiber. Um, you know, especially like you know, I need to be on a budget. And so for my kids, I get a lot of hand-me-downs and it's like, if it's at least half natural fiber, I keep it. Otherwise it goes back to the donation bin. Um, and then of course, we also want to avoid anything that has flame retardants embedded into the clothing. Yeah. Which is in a lot of children's things, which is just perfect. Um, <laughs> and bedding. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, and, and the original idea for that was that the babies would be safe from, you know, a smoking parent dropping a cigarette in their crib. And it's just like... Mm. <laughs> so now, so now we're all supposed to in flame retardants, yeah. Um, and so, so, so the easiest way to switch over from like the, you know, like the, the polyester flame retardant enriched, we'll say, um, like pajama footy things, the zippy things that they sell, the sleepers they sell for babies and toddlers is to find one that is, it'll be thin. It'll feel like cotton. So get a cotton one and it should be like slim because they make it form fitting if it's sleepwear and it's cotton because then it doesn't need the flame retardant because it's less likely for it to flail around and catch an errant flame. I don't know, it's weird, but it's just something to keep an eye out for. When you wear cotton, linen, wool, or silk, um, it's breathable. And if your clothes are breathable, then your skin can also breathe and, and do its exchanges through the, through the clothes. Um, especially important with um, blankets too, when you're sleeping. I know the fuzzy blankets are really fun and really warm. Uh, there, it would be better to have cotton or wool on your bed. Um, but I know that's not always possible, right? <laughs> um, so kind of what I do is whenever I go to buy new clothes, I look for a natural fiber. Um, am I throwing out all of my old clothes? Not necessarily. Do I never accept donations? Not necessarily. So it's, you know, you figure out for yourself what you want to do. But that is <laughs> the last lecture that I listened to from Dr. Christopher. He said, this is the most important thing I can tell you today. Wear natural fibers. Yeah. The most it, yes. Amazing for the man who's all about pooping, you know? I hope that made them laugh, the graders that'll watch this later. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, so that's, that's skin. Um, for lungs, we talked about breathing. We talked about exercise. Um, there's certain lung restorative herbs like mullein, lobelia, peppermint. We talked about that with the asthma. Um, but if you're not in like an acute asthma attack, that routine isn't necessarily what you want to do. Um, instead, you would want to be taking your like lung tonic herbs. So your mullein, peppermint, elecampane, comfrey, lungwort, ephedra, grows right up in those hills, the brigham tea. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and that the brigand tea also, I mean, it's, it's anti syphilis, which like I know we don't have an issue with, but it has a lot of benefits. One of them is more energy. Um, so I need to be drinking more of it when I'm studying. Um, anyway, so there's a lot of options. This is, this is one of the things I love. God put so many options on the earth in terms of which plants we can use for what thing and how to heal our bodies generally. Um, yeah. Yeah. They died of old age because yeah. they knew what earth was paid. Yeah. Yeah. And it said there, they had a lot of fevers and some died from the fevers, but most didn't because they used the plants that grew around them. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So that's about it. Um, I have two morning drinks because it is springtime and this is a great time to transition from our heavy, thick winter blood that keeps us warm to our thinner spring blood that lets us be cool. Um, and so two different drinks, um, Dr. Christopher's green drink, um, I don't have exact proportions because you kind of figure out what you like yourself. Um, I use either, um, lemons or oranges or pineapple. He really recommends pineapple. It has lots of great enzymes. Um, excuse me for your digestion. Um, excuse me again. <laughs> so I'd say like, you know, a cup or two of pine, pineapple juice or, or like a lemon or two, add some water if you want to. And then a few handfuls of wild greens, like red raspberry leaf, comfrey leaf, mallow, nettles. Um, you can put spinach or other green things in there, but this is Dr. Christopher's green drink. And the idea is that you blend it all together and you drink it, you chew it fiber and all, but um, here's the thing. If you still have a weak stomach, weaker stomach, and you don't handle all that fiber so well, or you just don't like how you have to chew it in your mouth, it is totally okay to strain out the pulp and drink it like a lemonade. And it's totally okay to add some real maple syrup or raw honey to it. Those add more minerals. Um, find a way to enjoy it because if you enjoy it, you will do it. And the more you do it, the more benefit you will get. And so infusing yourself with those fresh spring greens um, is, is great. Um, the Dr. Schultz morning drink, um, again, he was a student of Dr. Christopher's. He uses eight ounces of fresh squeezed juice, eight ounces of distilled water, a half cup to one cup of fresh fruit, two tablespoons of nutritional yeast, and a quarter to a teaspoon of spirulina and or chlorella. So he's added in that nutritional yeast and spirulina chlorella that add in a ton of iron, chlorophyll, um, B vitamins, protein. Um, so that's a really nice one. Yeah, I'll send this out to you guys. So that is everything I had to present now that it is an hour later than we were supposed to be done. Um, let me see if any questions came through here. I'm not seeing any questions. Does anyone else have questions before we finish? Yeah, big question I think for everybody is how to get yourself to do it. Yeah. I can't answer that because that's individual. <laughs> okay, so how, maybe it's the same thing. How do you how do you talk yourself into taking the first step? You know, it's the same it's the same mental process of getting yourself to do something that's not necessarily comfortable. You right. have to be able to allow for some discomfort, and I think you always have to involve how my father just like. <clears throat> Set it at his feet. Hey, my father, I cannot get myself to eat the way that I know I should. Please take care of the problem. Now, what do you want me to do? While well, you take care of the problem, what do you want me to do? Yeah. You know, go help somebody weed their yard. Um, another, another, there's a lot of little techniques like, what would I be doing instead? 
are you recording? Okay. Yeah. Oh. Can I, oh. uh, there was a question to repeat the question asked by the audience. So the question was, how do you get yourself to actually do the things? Yeah. And so Jill's answering that. Let me know if you can hear her answer. Otherwise I'll summarize it in the microphone. So, so um, another thing to do that's really powerful is to process the notion. Why do I want to overeat right now? And you can, you can do that a couple of ways. You can just breathe into it and just allow the emotion to flow through you. And, um, or you, or you just, the biggest thing is to observe the emotion, just to acknowledge it. Oh, I'm feeling angry or I'm feeling bored or I feeling um, down on myself. What you, you just name the feeling and Observe it with curiosity is really powerful. And you can actually see it because the feelings are always in your body. Wrong? If you think a thought, and the thought causes what? Uh, hormones and chemicals oh, to release no. and also somewhere in the body. Where which is it? One? What does it look like? What color, oh, what shape, what size, what texture? You just observe it. And I always say to it, I see you. Because mostly you're trying to acknowledge the emotion, which is actually acknowledging yourself. And you and you breathe with it. It's really, really powerful. But if you could just pause and say, "What am I feeling?" Can you not hang on? Process that, stuff, that motion Thank you. a little bit, and then say, "What, what do you want?" What I be doing instead? Another up? trick is to just go outside and walk around the house instead <laughs> of. And then by that time, your desire for the second helping will be gone. You just have to interrupt it. And those are a few things. I mean, there's more that you can do, but. Yeah, so again, in the yeah, chat, it's funny because it says I'm talking to myself. This must be my husband on my, <laughs> somehow on my account. Um, yeah, and so how do you actually implement the things that, that you learn? Um, so Jill gave some great examples. She's a life coach, acquirelight.com. Um, <laughs> um, so observing your thoughts and, and, and observing your feelings and feeling them. And, um, you know, there's lots of different places you can go there. Um, what I recommend, because again, I really only shared the tip of the iceberg, like there's so much more that you can layer on to heal faster or more completely. Um, but again, the only person who really knows what your journey is supposed to be is Heavenly Father. And so I really see it as take in the information, ask yourself, did anything like particularly spark with me? Like what's one thing that I can add or remove that like, that feels like something I can handle right now. And take that to the Lord in prayer and be like, okay, I think this is what I want, what I want to do. Is, is this right for me? Is this the right timing? Is this the right thing to do? Can you help me see how to make this a habit? Um, and if there wasn't anything that sparked, if this was just like pure overwhelm <laughs> or like, nope, that all sounds totally wrong. <laughs> Um, and pray about that too. Like, is there something I didn't see that you'd like me to see? Um, and, and that's really it. Because again, I go back to, even if you ate everything perfectly and you were in the cleanest environment possible, not sterile, but the most natural <laughs> clean environment you could be in. Um, if you're not working on your thoughts and your heart too, there's only so far you can go. And, and really like Jill's a great life coach. I've worked with lots of great therapists, but really it comes down to you and God. And that's the only, that's where it's really going to happen. Um, our best coaches point us back to him. Is what? Our, our coaches yeah. point us back to him. Yeah, our coaches point us back to him. Yeah. In fact, I know a really good coach who recently said, no, I'm not going to coach you. You're supposed to talk with God about that one. <laughs> She's right there. <laughs> that's that's when you know you've got a really good coach. <laughs> so, <clears throat> well, thank you so much for listening. Um, yeah, if there's thank you. <laughs> if there's anything else I can help with, I'm happy to. You know, if you want to dive deeper into into anything else, um, figuring out like where to start or answer any other questions, you know where I live. <laughs> So, okay, thanks. That was excellent. No.
Oh, it's just good. It's like, I feel powerful now. <laughs>